Okay, so you're looking at the screen behind me and you see this title. How many, how many of you guys are country music fans? Do we have any? Yeah, a little bit. So in Thailand, uh, you can imagine when we turn on the radio, we don't hear any country music, right? So, uh, but we used to, and when we come back for the summers, uh, we, my wife especially, she'll tune into the, the country radio. Uh, so... When she did that this year, I, I, there was a couple songs about kicking up dust, right? So some of you guys, you know Luke Bryan. Who's a Luke Bryan fan? Any, anybody? Yeah, so a couple of you. I don't know the song that he sang about kicking up dust, but this Blake Shelton guy, anybody know Blake? So yeah, that guy, he's got this song, and there's like a part of that song in the chorus. He says, Redneck, redneck, redneck. You know what I'm talking about? How about uh, chew tobacco, chew tobacco, chew tobacco, spit. You know what I'm talking about, all right? So I won't sing that song or perform that. I just want to put this out there. That song is about partying in cornfields, right? Or something to that effect. That's not what my message is about. I'm just putting that out there. We're not going to talk about that. Kicking up dust is a, a phrase in the original language of the Bible. When they wanted to talk about serving, ministering to people, there's this Greek word, diakoneo, diakoneo. I won't make you say that, but that word literally means to kick up dust, right? And so when Christians were running around, serving the people around them in very tangible and very practical ways, they were said to be kicking up dust, right? Because they're on the move so much that there's just dust flying off their feet everywhere they go in the service of other people. So that's what I want to talk to you guys about today, kicking up dust. I want us all to become a people who spend more of our time kicking up dust for the people uh, around us. So we're going to jump right in. I'm not one of those preachers that takes like 20 minutes to open the Bible. I like to get that thing open right away. So if you have a Bible uh, or a device with a Bible app, we're going to be in John 13. So you can go ahead and make your way to John 13. And I'm going to jump in here in verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God, and that he was returning to God. So this is the moment that what we just did, that act of remembrance, the bread and, and the wine, this is where it all started, right? Like the thing that we just participated in, it was born in this meal. And um, Zach actually just made reference to that. And we talked about this meal, right? So in this meal, Jesus is going to have much to say. In fact, John chapter 14 and 15 and 16 and 17, that's going to be the most read letters, the words of Jesus that you're going to find in the gospel of John, right? And, and perhaps all of the gospels. Jesus does a lot of talking in this, this, these last hours that he spends with his disciples, but he also does something else, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. He, he doesn't just say things, he's going to do something. And so we get to that here in verse 4. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Now here's what's interesting, and uh, Zach had just alluded to this. So at this meal, the disciples are there, and they're bickering and arguing about who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They all want that seat, right? They all want their place in his kingdom. And at the moment that they are doing this, Jesus takes his rabbi clothes off, right? And he wraps the, the clothes, the garment that a slave would wear in his time. He takes the lowest position. He says, you want to be the greatest? Here's, how, here's what it looks like. It means becoming the least, right? And so uh, Paul, in his letter to uh, the Philippians, he's also going to talk about how Jesus, who was equal to God, did not regard his equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a 
bond servant, right? So this is Jesus reenacting, like doing those very words uh, that Paul is talking about, right? Serving the people, uh, getting ready to serve them. And, and then we see him do that very thing. Look at verse five. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And so now you have Jesus not just like taking on the appearance of a slave, now he's doing the work of a servant. And I really mean the lowest servant that you can imagine. So if we were to all uh, go back into the first century world, any house before any of us are gonna enter anyone's home, What's going to happen is one thing's going to happen. Um, I don't think you're wearing your shoes in the house, right? So some of us, we have that rule. But the other thing that's going to happen, there's going to be a basin outside the home full of water. And what's going to happen is the lowest servant within that household, they're going to uh, they're going to get water. They're going to take a towel and get water from that basin. And they're going to clean off your feet before you enter the house. All right, so that's just customary in the first century. That's what you do. That's the simple hospitality that you'll offer when somebody comes into your home. So here we are at the Last Supper. All of these people that Jesus has been teaching and mentoring, they're all in the house, and not one of them offered to do this, right? Like, like here's Jesus himself becoming the servant, becoming and doing the work of the lowest person, the lowest servant in the household, it's astonishing what Jesus is doing in this moment, right? And I can't imagine. So in Thailand, it's hot, it's dry, and uh, anybody know what a pedicure is, right? Ladies, I, I don't do that, but what I do with my wife from time to time, I get a foot scrub, all right? And I'm not afraid to uh, acknowledge that and, and put that out there, right? So, so from time to time, there's, uh, we, we go into a mall and we go into a little shop and uh, there's a woman that washes my wife's feet and a woman that washes mine. And you have to do this in Thailand. So I, you'd understand if you were there and you wore flip-flops and it was dusty, right? So, but here's the thing. My wife, she'll look over and they're scraping skin off, right? And so like the dead skin. Some of you guys have gotten haircuts where you had like a pile of hair like down on the floor. You're like, oh my goodness, I had that much cut off. So that's like my experience, except it's dead skin. Like it's just a huge pile. And we feel so sorry for this woman that is down there on her hands and her knees having to do that. Can you imagine if Jesus was doing something like that? Like, can you imagine if it's Jesus himself at your feet, taking your feet into his hands and washing them? I can't. I feel bad for this lady in Thailand. I can't imagine Jesus doing something to serve me in this way. And so Peter, the other disciples, they don't have to imagine because it's happening to them. And so verse six, Peter says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Right? He's like, this cannot be happening. Like we should be, the rules should be reversed. Like you should not be doing this. This isn't right. That's Peter's feeling. And then Jesus responds, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. And by the way, that's the story of Jesus's life. If you read the gospels, but you don't read the end. Like if you don't read about his death and his resurrection and his pouring his spirit out on his people, you don't read about all that stuff that happens at the end of the gospels, the rest of his life, the rest of his ministry, it's not going to make sense. It only makes sense in light of what he does at the end of his life and his ministry. Uh, you have to see the cross, you have to see his resurrection, and then you'll understand. And so Peter, he's one of those people, he would actually give the first Christian sermon, right? He would share the gospel, be the first one to do that, because later he understood. So at that point, Peter, he's, he's still like, I'm not completely on board with this. Like, I really don't want you to be doing this. Like, actually, like, Jesus, don't do it. And by the way, if you find yourself commanding Jesus, telling him what he can and cannot do, um, you're probably not doing it right, all right? So that's where he's at, but I'd probably do the same thing. And uh, so Jesus responds, verse eight, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And here's the deal. That's not just about somebody and his feet in the first century in the upper room at the last supper. 
That is every human being on earth who has ever lived in all places at all times, right? It's every one of us. We have to go to Jesus for cleansing. We're not gonna be cleansing ourselves, right? So that's a huge statement, really, in the midst of uh, this foot washing. So at that point, Peter, he's like, all right, just grab that basin, right? Here's my hands and here's my head. Just go ahead and, and pour the water, like dump the whole bucket on me. That's his feeling because he wants to be with Jesus, right? And Jesus says, hey, I'm, I'm just giving an object lesson. You've already washed yourself this morning. You don't need a bath, right? I'm just trying to teach you something. And so we read, uh, Jesus explains what he's just done. Look at verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, listen to this, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So in other words, he's just kind of wrapped up, like here's what I've done. I've given you an object lesson. I've demonstrated something to you that you might go out and do the same thing that I've done for you to one another and to the people uh, around you, right? So we could go back and, and go through this verse by verse, and we could do like a really deep dive into this, but I wanna teach today kind of the way that I teach in Thailand. So in Thailand, I'm a teacher, a preacher, that sort of thing at a Thai church. We also work with Cambodian migrant children uh, who are living in Bangkok. So that's the two things that we do, but I wanna teach. So I normally teach first generation Christians. I teach people that were Buddhist and now they are believers. I teach some people that are still Buddhist and we're trying to, you know, push them towards um, becoming believers in Christ. So uh, when I do that, I have to do it in a very, uh, very simplistic, very uh, basic way, in a way that they can understand. And so I'm gonna offer the same thing to you today. Rather than doing a deep theological dive, I just wanna give you some takeaways, some things that we can take from what Jesus just did uh, what he just showed his disciples, and, and we can go out and do what he expected and demands those guys to do. So uh, we're just gonna make three simple points, three simple takeaways, and I hope to challenge you a bit, encourage you a bit, maybe even convict some of us in this room a bit. So uh, the number one, uh, the first thing we see is that we learn that there is no person that is beneath you or unworthy of your time and attention. There's no person that is beneath you. So Jesus is Lord of all, and he becomes what? Least of all, right? Jesus is the greatest, and he assumes the position of uh, the least, and Jesus did not walk throughout his life and his ministry and come up to each person, like anybody that was before him, and say, well, well let me evaluate you before I can decide and determine whether or not I'm going to serve you. Right? He didn't do a case-by-case case basis where he said, well, let me think about your income. Let me think about your background. Let me think, I, I don't know about your skin color. I don't know about your nationality. I don't know who you voted for. I don't know if you have a criminal record or not. I don't know if it's going to benefit me if I serve you. He didn't ask any of those questions. Anybody that came before Jesus, he said, you are worthy of serving. You are worthy of dying for. Right? In fact, two guys, all right, at that table who, and, and then in the foot washing, two guys are there. One guy, we already talked about it in the text, is going to betray him. Did he stop and say, no, I'm, I'm skipping you? No, he washed his feet. Another guy's going to deny him after saying, hey, bathe me with water. He's going to deny him three times. Did he stop and say, hey, Peter, I'm not washing your feet, man? No. He washed their feet too, right? He didn't say to anybody in his life, you are beneath me. He said to everyone in his life, I'm gonna get beneath you. I'm gonna kick up dust for you. I'm gonna serve you. I'm actually gonna go a step further. I'm going to be buried in dust for you. 
I'm going to die for you. I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. That's Jesus. And I want to introduce you to somebody uh, on the other side of the world. Uh, her name is Pookie. So Pookie here is a, a waitress. She lives, she works about five minutes from where we live. And so they have wonderful Thai food. It's a good atmosphere. It's not expensive. All right. So we frequent this place often. But the number one reason why we go there often is not the food. Food. It's not the atmosphere. It's Pookie herself. Like the first time that we walked in there, she was a woman that we could practice our, our Thai with, speak the Thai language in a not so great way. And she wouldn't make fun of us. She wouldn't give us a hard time for it. She was patient with us and she would practice her English. And so over the last couple of years, we've gotten to know her and uh, not, we know her way beyond the surface now. Like we know that she was in an abusive relationship, that she left left her husband and she has two daughters that she's raising up on her own uh, and she's working a minimum wage job. We know when her birthday is. We know all kinds of things about her. We know what she likes to do uh, when she's not working, right? She knows our birthdays. She gave me a fake uh, Rolex watch this year for mine, so that was awesome. I'm not, I'm not wearing it. I really should. But anyway, we love this woman. We adore this woman. And she would say the same thing and has said the same thing about us. In fact, she's even been texting me this week from Thailand asking, when are you guys going to come back? I miss you so much. So we love this lady. But here's the, here's the difference between us and the other people that come into her restaurant. They don't know her name. And they don't really care to know her name, right? Like she's just somebody that works at a restaurant. She's just somebody that's there to serve the other customers, right? And so she's invisible to most of the, the customers. So the, the difference is that we see her, right? And it's not because we're special. Or she's kind of taught to do that. And like Jesus kind of teaches us to do that. We see her, right? And we serve her and we love her. And because of that, we're the only people in Pookie's life that can effectively share the gospel with her, right? And so along those lines, I want to ask you, are there people in your life who are invisible to the other people around them? Are there people in your life right now who maybe for weeks or maybe for months or even years, you've had this person in front of you, maybe at a restaurant or a gas station or something like that, maybe a coworker, but you don't actually, and maybe even in the church, you don't, even, you don't know their name, right? You don't know anything beyond the surface? Are there people that maybe you could have a huge impact on? Are there people that maybe you're their only chance of hearing the gospel, right? And all it takes is just to see them, right? And maybe to figure out a way to serve them. That's one thing that Jesus shows us. Here's the second thing. We also learn that there's no task that is beneath you or unworthy of your time and attention. There's no task. So Jesus, again, he is performing the, all right, I want to emphasize this, the lowest task that you could do in the first century world, right? There was nothing lower than being the person that got out the basin and washed people's feet, all right? That is it. That is the bottom rung of society, the lowest task, and here's Jesus, the Messiah, the King of Kings, who is the one doing it. Right? I can't emphasize that enough. Okay, I've talked some music at the outset and talked some, uh, some country guys. I'll get more hands on this. How many of you guys, you know Meatloaf, all right? Put your hand up if you know this guy. Put your hand up if you think he's incredibly attractive. Okay, so I, I, I shouldn't make these jokes anymore because somebody told me he passed and it's not right to, you know. Uh, so anyway, I'm gonna, I don't know Meatloaf that well, but there's one song uh, that I do know, and I'm hoping that you know it too. If you do, all right, you can sing. I'll, I'll leave the back end of this open. All right, you can sing it, the rest of it. He says, I would do anything for love, but I... Boom, good job. Okay, so we know that song. The interesting thing about that song is like, man, that's not what love is, meatloaf. Like, like if you're going to do anything for somebody else, if you're going to truly love them, then you don't really have this list of things that you're unwilling to do, right? Like it just doesn't really work that way. So it, it made me think as I'm thinking about no task that, that is beneath us. 
it made me think, like, like I want you to, to go back in time. Those of you who are in a relationship, you're married, you have a, a partner. Um, I want you to imagine it's like your second or third date with this person, okay? And the man in this relationship, he brings a list with him to that date. He says, there's so many things that I'm willing to do for you, and here's a list of those things. But here are the things that I'm not, right? I'll do anything for love, baby, but here are the things that I won't, right? And then he, he, he shows you the list, ladies. And on that list, it says, I will not clean, right? I will never cook, right? I might use the grill from time to time, but I ain't going to do anything in the kitchen, right? Uh, I will not change, never. Like, you're not going to change me. I will not be considerate. Don't care about your feelings, okay? Just sorry. Um, I... Like, and that's just the things that start with the letter C, right? And then he adds to that, and I'm never going to put toilet seats down. That's not happening either. Are, are you guys, if that scenario happens, are you still together? Like, how did that work out? It didn't work out because he wasn't really willing. He's like, meatloaf, I'll do anything, but I won't do that. He had a list of things that he was unwilling to do. So that's a funny little story that we can imagine and that would have been the destruction of our relationships, right? But I think it happens in reality where we all have these little internal lists of things that we just won't do. So I worked with a guy, I worked over in Cincinnati growing up. Before I was uh, a Christian, I was in the corporate world working at a bank and there was a, a, a gentleman there and his, his car broke down, right? And he's like, uh, hey man, can you give me a, a ride? Like, can you actually like take me to and from work for just a couple of days, right? And then a couple of days turned into, oh man, my, my car is still in the shop and they're telling me it's gonna be there for two more weeks. Can you help a brother out? No, <laughs> like, like no, like two days, I was good with that, two weeks. That's pushing it. I got, you know, I get, I'm a busy guy, all right? I don't really have time for that. That's not convenient, right? Is there a story in your life that's similar to that? Well, how about this, all right? At churches, at most churches, there are lists, right? There are sign-up sheets. Some of our churches now, they've gone digital, and there's, there's Google Forms, right? Uh, but... I just talked to, to somebody out there that, that kind of leads the greeting ministry, and he said, like, even at this size church, we still have all kinds of issues getting volunteers for the greeting ministry, right? And, and pretty much every church that we go to throughout the summer, there are lists that need a whole lot more names on them, right? And, but if you're like me, what, what do you do? when the church announces, hey, we, we need some help in this area. We need some help with VBS. We need some help uh, packing boxes. Whatever it is, we will get to that list. We will look that list over. We will evaluate what's on that list, and we will be very disappointed when the thing that we most wanted to do is already taken, right? The easiest thing to do is already taken. The thing that most suits our personality or our gifts is already taken. And at that moment, when the only thing left on there is cleaning the bathroom, right? Most of us, myself included, we're out, right? Like we walk away. Like, like if that's what's left, I'm willing to do so much for this church, but I won't do that. Right? Are you with me? Is anybody with me? Would you, would you actually acknowledge that? I, I, I have no problem. I've, even being the leader, the pastor of a church, I, I've walked away from the list. Right? We've been there and done that. So it's usually only after evaluating like, what it is that somebody needs us to do. It's only after we've looked at that and we know what it is that we'll decide whether or not we're going to do it. Like most of us don't just blindly say, hey, whatever it is that you happen to need, I'm here for you and I'll do it, right? So if it's too insignificant in our eyes, if it's too uncomfortable, if it's too inconvenient, if it's too difficult, if it's too demanding, if it's too demeaning, that's what Jesus was doing, something very demeaning, then we often say, I'm out. I'll do anything. I love you, but yeah, I'm not going to do 
that. So Jesus, on the other hand, he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the one through whom this whole universe came into existence and keeps on existing. Uh, Paul says that he holds all things together. So the very one who holds all things together also gets on his hands and his knees and he washes feet and ultimately goes beyond that. He dies on a cross. And if he's willing to do that, and he's much higher than all of us, then what task exactly is beneath you and I? What task is there that we shouldn't do for somebody else? Now, along those lines, I wanna bring you back to, to Thailand. So um, I'm gonna show you a picture of some Cambodians. So we have uh, over three million Cambodian people that have come as migrant workers. Some of them ha are there against their will. They've been trafficked. Some of them uh, have, co have come seeking a, a better life. Uh, and so they're largely, to the people around them, to the Thai people, they're invisible, like nobody sees them. Nobody cares that they're there. Certainly nobody wants to know what their names are or get to know them, right? They're just people that are there to do jobs. They make about 10 US dollars per day, working about 12 hours a day, six days a week. They don't have access to health insurance. Their kids do not have access to education because the Thai people not only don't see them, they despise them. They've got that Jewish Samaritan thing going on, right? And so they look down on them. And so these people are largely unseen in the place where we live. But there's this couple named Vino and Vicky. And I intentionally went with this picture because I want you to look at Vino's shirt. What's on that? Like, is he sweating a bit? Yeah. And that's because he serves these Cambodian people. So uh, specifically, he serves children, the children that live at migrant camps all over Bangkok, the Cambodian kids that we work with. They live in not so great conditions. They live in ramshackle huts, right? They don't have access to uh, running water. They actually do bathe in large basins of water like some of our great grandparents might have, right? They don't have the best living conditions. They don't have access to good nutrition. They don't uh, have access to, again, education. They're at risk. They're vulnerable. Sometimes they are trafficked, right? These kids are all over Bangkok, and so they're unseen, and people are largely indifferent to their plight. But Vino and Vicky, they saw them, they see them. Somebody approached them, a missionary, about seven or eight years ago, and they said, because um, Vino speaks English, and they said, Vino, you're teaching English to Thai kids. Would you also start teaching English to Cambodian children? And he said, yes. Right? And then eventually it became, hey, they want to learn more than one day a week. Will you teach them three days a week? And he said, yes. And then eventually it became five days a week. And eventually it became, Vino, we actually need you to pick up the kids from various camps around Bangkok and take them back to your ministry, back to your church. Will you do that? He said, yes. And then it became some of the kids and their families saying, hey, Vino, we don't like where we're living. We, we, we feel afraid. We, we're vulnerable. Will you allow kids to live on site at your church and sleep in mosquito nets outside with them? And he said, yes. And he just kept saying yes to these simple acts that any human can do, right? And through those simple acts, uh, the ministry that, that we know and that we are not a, a part of, we have two orphanages over in Cambodia, and we have a ministry in Thailand that houses about 50 kids. We have a brand new dorm that, that was built this year. There are incredible things happening. Uh, we have over 100 people that have been baptized uh, and, and even more uh, over in Cambodia. So there's all kinds of things happening, but I wanna introduce you to just one person at the back end of this. Uh, so this is Virat. Vira is a kid, he's not a kid anymore, he's 22, but he uh, is somebody that Bobby Joe, that's my wife and I, we got to personally know and to teach in Thailand. And he, as I've just said here, is an artist, he's primarily an artist, but he's also now an author. And I can prove it because 
I have his book, right? And you can have his book, by the way, a little uh, plug here. Uh, this is on Amazon. It's called Drawn to Hope. It's a play on words, Drawn to Hope. If you type in those words on Amazon.com, this will be your first hit. And I, I would really encourage you, every uh, penny that is spent on this book, and I bought a few, not that I need them, but I want to give and help him. Every penny uh, that doesn't go to Amazon ends up in his hands. It's about $3.62 per copy sold. So anyway, this is his illustrated journey of his life. He is one of the kids whose parents came seeking a better life, right? And I'll show you the first page of this book. Uh, so this is how it starts. He talks about how he loved to run with his friends back in Cambodia. He had all kinds of nature around him. He worked in rice fields and he didn't hate his life. That's important. He actually appreciated everything that he had and he really appreciated being able to go to school. And then his parents said, no, 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 we want a better life and it's over there across the border. So the next uh, slide, this is where Vino came to live. These are the ramshackle huts that I was uh, telling you about. Virat, I'm sorry. This is where he came to live. And so here's the thing I want to share. Uh, He was a Buddhist living in Cambodia, all right? His family was in search of a better life, and his life got worse, like, like his life actually took him uh, to that kind of place. Uh, he no longer had access to education, right? He was vulnerable. It was a dangerous place living at this migrant camp. So in no way, shape, or form, physically speaking, was his life better when they crossed the border, right? Actually, he has less opportunities, physically speaking, than he did back in Cambodia. But here's the thing that did happen. Look at this page of the book. He came to know Jesus Christ. He came to be found in him. The gospel came in because that's what Vino was ultimately doing when he taught English and he slept in mosquito nets and all the various ways that he served uh, Virat and all those other children. It was ultimately about this one thing, making Jesus Christ known. And here's the thing about V-Rot now, he still lives in those huts. He's going to probably continue to be very physically poor for the rest of his life. He's probably going to do very hard labor and not get paid very well for it. He's going to continue to live in a place where people don't see him or care to know him. But he has Jesus Christ living in his heart. He has a new life. He has been changed from the inside out. Right? And I want to read you the, the last page of his book. He said this, I still like to run, but now I have a different race to serve God the rest of my life as an artist. I want my work and my life to illustrate the living hope I found in Jesus. That's happening right now, isn't it? It's happening right now. And so here's the thing I want to come back to for all of us because you don't have to be on the other side of the world to see stories like this, to see transformation like this. If, if you and I, if we would just serve people in the most simplistic and basic ways, none of us can possibly imagine what God might accomplish. I want you to take, if you take nothing else, take that We don't have to serve in profound ways. You don't have to get on a plane and go 24 hours to Thailand and wear masks again for the next year. You don't have to do that, right? You can serve people right where you are and things like this can happen. You can meet your own V-Rots in your life. Okay, last thing I wanna point out here uh, before I go too long. Third point is this. When you serve others, you get blessed too. That's what Jesus said. Those aren't my words, right? Jesus said that at the end of uh, his foot washing. He said, you know, and, and here's the thing. So I was a, I was a pastor, pastor before, uh, before I was a missionary. So I've always been a preacher, I guess, wherever I've been. But uh, in my experience, I met so many people sitting in pews, and maybe I was one of them at one point, um, who they just don't feel connected to God, like some of the people 
in their lives. Like they look around the church and they say, like they have some joy, they have some, some serious closeness to God that I just don't have and I desire it, but I don't know where to find it. I don't know how to have that joy and that peace that, that this person has. And I think a lot of people try to answer that question by saying, well, I probably need more people to serve me. Like if I, if I come into the church and I get this prayer circle around me, I get these people to pour into me and there's nothing wrong with that and you probably, we could all use that. But they think the, the, the trick is, the key is to have people serve them more and if they're served more like a plant, they, they will grow, right? But Jesus says the opposite is actually true. That real blessing happens, that real joy and real peace it happens not when we are served, but when we are like Christ and we go and we do the serving, right? That's when the blessing comes. All right, so I want to put one more picture and, and just show you that. So these are just some of the kids that we worked with, and this is before uh, COVID, so the masks are off, right? Um, but you see that joy, and do you see our joy? Because here's what happens every time, like, we think about, so we're going back in one week. One week from today, we're going to leave our families again. We're going to leave all that's easy and familiar. And things like grocery shopping are much easier here, right? And simple things. We're going to leave all of that for another 10 months at least, and we're going to go back. They make it all worth it. And seeing them come to know Jesus, come to serve Jesus, come to love him, and come to, they go out and they go on missions all the time and they go and spread the gospel that's come in for them. And my goodness, nothing gives us more satisfaction than being with those kids, than just loving on those kids. We serve them and we are blessed too. And I'm telling you, if you find a pocket of people to serve, the same thing will be true for you. All right, I'm going to wrap this up by just asking a, a couple of questions. I want you to ask yourself these two questions. Kind of wrestle with this as you go throughout this week. The first question is this. I want you to ask, where does my trail of dust lead? All right, so let's say that you've kicked up this trail of dust this past week. And I actually got a chance to go and follow your trail what would it lead me to? Who would it lead me to? I'll be honest with you, like if you were to follow my trail of dust, it would most often lead back to me. Like it would uh, most often lead back to my home. It would most often lead back to my family. And, and, and that's not all bad, all right? We should serve them a little bit. We should serve ourselves uh, a, a little bit. But does it lead to any lost people? Does it lead to any saved people that need some comfort, need some encouragement, need some edification? Where does your trail of dust lead? Because I imagine most people in this room are exhausted, or at times you are. Are you exhausted because of serving yourself? Or are we exhausted because we're kicking up so much dust for the people around us? The second question is this. Who can I start to kick up dust for instead, right? If you're like me and you're like, man, my trail most often leads right back to me in my own life and this little kingdom that I'm building, how can I step out? Who can I step out and serve instead? And maybe that begins by just looking at a list here at the church. 